There seems to be a lot of hatred in the world today. Rational, irrational. I mean, the very essence of hatred seems to be irrational. But we see hatred between individuals in politics, in the media, between nations, wars, with no end in sight. It could be quite depressing when you think about it. For the record, there's plenty of love too. I'm sure each of us can identify beautiful acts of nobility, virtue, selflessness. But that doesn't take away from the hatred. Is there a solution? A long-term solution, a sustainable solution. Please join me as we continue the series of our 60-day journey. Hi, this is Simon Jacobson, and we continue our journey, the 60-day journey, second part of a series, Finding Love in Times of Hate. This program is dedicated in honor of our hostages, our brave soldiers, and those we have lost, in memory of the fallen and with deep gratitude for the courageous soldiers fighting to protect and save our beloved Israel. Hatred. A toxic word, a horrible word, a word that divides us, that separates, that creates so much pain. You look around, there seems to be a lot of hatred. Countries at war, people attacking others, whether it's physical, literally. I mean, I speak as a Jew the anti-Semitism, irrational hatred. I don't know if there's such a thing as rational hatred, but there's hatred with excuses, if you wish. And of course, even in the communal level, family level, for full accuracy, we have to also acknowledge there's a tremendous amount of love in the world. Each one of us can identify beautiful acts of nobility, selflessness, virtue. But I want to address the darker side, the hatred. Is there hope? Can we find love in times of hate? What can we do about it? Personally, let's say someone offended you, hurt you. And you feel justifiably that you have negative feelings toward them. I understand negative feelings doesn't mean hatred, but it could evolve into that. You see people that behave in certain ways, that act in certain ways, say certain things. It evokes hatred. Or it could be a hatred that's deep-rooted, basically cultural. In your home, in your community, in your, your family, your parents. They taught you to hate. What do we do with this cancer? Is there a way to eliminate it? And what about if you see it around you, but you're not part of it? Do we just ignore it? Is there something we can do to bring more love in the world? So I want to address this first by getting to the root of all hatred. And then discussing and addressing what we can do about it. So the root of all divisiveness, of all dissonance, for that matter, which may be one of the 
more demonic manifestations, manifestations of it is hatred, is in Kabbalistic terminology called the tzimtzum, the concealment, the great concealment. Referring to, think of it as a cosmic big bang, if you wish, where essentially we are all part of one organism. Not, every, not only every human being on this earth, but every fiber of existence, every cell. I mean, just basic physics tells us this. And you look at nature, you look at the human body. What is a healthy organism? Many different parts, but they're all coordinated. They all need each other. Is there room for hatred of the right arm to the left arm, or for the heart to the mind, or the liver to the lungs? Or from flowers to trees to animals? to mineral, they all work together in the most powerful symbiotic fashion. Yes, there are times of disruption, but even that often becomes part of the... You know, you think of a forest fire. It's true, it's a fire, it destroys trees, it destroys land, but then it regenerates and often it becomes clear that it's part of the the, the cross pollination, if you wish, maybe that's out of context, but the idea of regenerating, rebuilding. So diversity does not mean divisiveness, does not mean hatred. Diversity is very much part of anything that is healthy. Think of a musical composition, many musical notes. The hues and colors of a beautiful piece of art of a book. It is the details, the multitude, the diversity within which we find the harmony that turns it into beauty. So then the question is, if it's really that way inherently, why then is there divisiveness? Why is there hatred? You have to say something else comes into play that causes us to be blinded by our inherent and integral unity and connection. So in the Kabbalistic terminology, Isaac Luria, the great 16th century Kabbalist, explains the idea of the tzimtzum, the concealment. That is concealed. Imagine the lungs don't know about the liver or don't know the need for each other. So then they can go to war. It doesn't necessarily begin with war, it begins with separation. But then the, device, the, the, the diversity turns into divisiveness because we're not appreciating each other. So it's about awareness. And ultimately leads us to a type of self-interest, self-contained reality that my good is not your good. Instead of understanding that if, I'm, if you're hurting, I'm hurting, and we're all affected, we now become these individuals taking care of myself. It's the basis, really, of how human society works. Your bank account is not mine. And the wealthy feel that the only way to remain wealthy is that some people have to not be wealthy. The idea of sharing equally is not, seems not natural to us. And that's exactly the paradox. Because... It should be natural. Now, why is this so important? Because when you understand the root, you can then say, okay, instead of just taking a Band-Aid or finding a short-term solution, we have to get to the root of it. And that's indeed why, and I quote this often in the chapter 32 in the classic magnum opus called the Tanya from Rabbi Shneir Zalm of the Adi. 32 in Hebrew is Lev. Love means heart. It also can be pronounced as love. And indeed, it's a chapter about love. And he says these words, that the essence of love, for the secret to love, is when spirit dominates over matter. Because as long as we see ourselves as material beings, separated by time and space, then yes, we could cooperate, we can coexist, we can find, we can negotiate terms that are mutually beneficial, but you don't have true love. 
True love is recognizing that inherent unity that lies beneath the surface of our superficial lives, where we can convince ourselves we're different and therefore we're separate. When in truth we're all part of one larger unity. And that requires a spiritual take. That requires seeing the spirit of things. Two objects in a room that don't have something of meaning, then they're just two isolated objects. Like I said, time and space separates us all. But that's what science teaches us, that we're not separated, that there's some type of connection between everything. But to access that, you have to get beyond the sensory tools of perceiving ourselves as different, but not just different, as separate, as apart. So in essence, and I don't want to wax philosophical here, because really it's a real issue on the ground. In essence, but we're beginning with a theory of it, let's go. In essence, the secret to love is to discovering spirit. That you and I may look different, culturally different, religiously different, faith, beliefs, non-beliefs, whatever it may be. The color of our skin, our race, our backgrounds, our education. That's the externals. But beneath the surface, we're all part of one larger reality. Now, what happens if we disagree? Well, if we're part of one larger reality, we have to figure out, maybe I can learn something from you, you from me. The problem is once it spills over, and this is where it's no longer philosophical, it spills over where you look at me as an enemy, or I look at you as an enemy. And I'm not saying that I don't feel I have any enemies in this world. But often that's what happens. Everyone blames each other. I also have no enemies, they'll say. Once you create that type of isolation or that type of separation to the point where you demonize and you vilify and you character assassinate the other, then that symptom has taken over. How can you ever get back to that integral unity? I don't want to sound naive and idealistic, but I often think about it, especially when I broadcast, and I know many people watching and listening to this are people of different persuasions. I get my share of hate mail. Not because of something I said necessarily, but sometimes people just see me as a threat for whatever reason. You know, talking about the conflicts today, the Muslim slash Arab Jewish conflicts. Not among all, but I always wonder when I'm speaking, why is it that we can't find that common denominator? We share common ancestry. We even share many beliefs. So I understand people are going to give all kinds of explanations. But if at the heart and soul we are really one, so even if there are grievances... I'm not, and the question is whether they're legitimate is another story. If they're not legitimate, then for sure we should be able to get beyond it. But what happens is emotions take over. Your narrative becomes your reality. And that's that. And the other person becomes something persona non gratis. You cancel them. You say, no way, we can never be at peace. But I still hold on to that hope because I do believe that we all come from one source. We're all created in the divine image. And as such, we're all part of one larger organism. And our differences and even our disagreements can actually become our asset to help us grow. But you have to get hatred out of your heart. So I will be very honest. I do not believe there are some people The toxins, the hatred has become their cancer. It defines their lives. To hate another. Sometimes even more than than loving their loved ones. That's how bad it can get. And once that takes over, literally like a cancer, it's a disease. But yet, there are enough people out there 
And even those that may hate, I believe, will still have a spark, and we hope to try to awaken it. So then what do we do? We talked about the root. Fine, beautiful. Well, beautiful, it's not so beautiful, but I'm saying beautiful as in the root of it all is a whole other reality. We're all part of one larger reality. We're all indispensable notes in a cosmic, beautiful musical composition. The harmony within diversity. But how do you access that, especially once hatred has taken over and become a force? I mean, we all share our blood-boiling feelings when you see how the Nazis marched Jews to the concentration camps, to the gas chambers. Literally. In a way, we talk about hatred, worse than hatred. Take innocent children, men, women. What do they do to you? Nothing. And decide that they are going to be eliminated, annihilated. And other forms of genocide throughout history. <clears throat> you see mutilation, brutality. Not just a war, and I don't want to minimize war, but I mean a, a malicious attempt to humiliate, to dehumanize. Those are the deepest collateral damage from the big symptom that doesn't minimize the pain so fine the root of it is the lack of understanding the unity but how do we get there and this is where my friends I'd like to us continue the 60 day journey you may be familiar with my book 60 days a spiritual guide to the high holidays which is the basis of this new series it's a journey precisely from darkness to light. It's one thing when you're living in a beautiful environment, everything's going well and smooth. It's another one we're faced with challenges. Yes, we live in a world where there is hatred. So we either can bury our heads in the sand and ignore and deny it, escapism, resignation is another option. Hey, you know, that survival of the fittest, what are you going to do? Or go to war in a futile effort of trying to resolve and not going anywhere. Or you can dig deeper and find hope. So this period in time, my friends, is exactly one that empowers us how to find light in times of darkness, how to find hope in times of fear, as we discussed in the previous part of this series, and how to find love in times of hate. So what's the story? We look back. We look at stories of where we saw hatred, where we saw more than a crack, a schism, a betrayal. And yet, digging deeper, we're able to find resolution. The only real way is not just a negotiated effort where, okay, you compromise, I compromise. Because that still can leave resentment and does not resolve the issue. The only way is to find that deeper place in our hearts and souls. It's interesting, some of our radical atheists like to remind us that wars are always fought in the name of religion. Religion has brought more war to this world than anything else. I don't think we can agree with that because World War II was not necessarily based on religion. The Nazis were not fighting the name of religion. Maybe they couldn't exist without Christianity and its inherent anti-Semitism, like some have argued. But it was not a religious war. There have been religious wars. But at the heart of it all, and I don't even like the word religion, as you may know, but at the heart of it all, religion at its best, faith at its best, was meant exactly that. Faith was synonymous with love. And love was synonymous with a light, the divine light that joins and unites us all, that prevails over any form of divisiveness and hatred. So it's really about getting to the heart and soul of who we really are. 
I often think if I was sitting with someone who literally hated me and brutally killed or raped or in some other way violated a person like me because I'm Jewish, if I was sitting with them right here across the table, would I be able to reach their heart and soul? So as I pointed out earlier, very unlikely if cancer has taken over. And especially they would blame me. And I'd say, what do you want me to do? And they say, I want you to be dead. Is that my, that's the solution. I want you to leave Israel and give us back the land. Would that be the solution? So my, in my so-called, if you, again, na- naive idealism, I would say, can I reach that person's soul? Let me talk to their children. Let me talk about their children. Let me talk to their parents. But there you may just see even more hatred. So that's why you have to choose your battles. Because I have seen, literally seen with my own eyes, the story unfold as it did thousands of years ago, that despite the betrayal, despite the losses, despite the odds being stacked against any hope, that we're able to find love even in a time of hate. But the only way was by finding something deeper than the hatred. So let's go back to the tzimtzum language. It means what in Hasidic and Kabbalistic terminology means to go to the infinite light that precedes the tzimtzum. It's called the Ereng Sof Lifniat Tzimtzum. Maybe a new concept that you may not have heard. But let's talk about it in simple psychological terms. It's like if there's an injury to the human body, what you want to do is access the immune system or layers, let's say a burn to the skin, deeper layers where the healing can begin. If you don't access that, then the wound can become infected and take over, God forbid. The same thing spiritually and psychologically. It's finding a deeper place where the hate has not reached yet. Well, yet is maybe a strong word. That hate does not, is not able to reach. Finding that thing in common. I remember counseling a couple who they claimed loved each other deeply for quite a few years, had children. And now they were at a point where love, I wish there was no love. It was much worse than that. It was literally despise contempt and I was trying to find something I said tell me what it was like when you your best days even trying to muster up some memory I saw it came with pain oh that's so long ago I said so did you change I didn't change each one of them said the other person changed he did something that betrayed me She didn't serve my needs. She became cold and distant, distracted. I mean, they all had a story. As we always know, there's three stories. His story, her story, and the true story. And you have to piece it together. I remember I was desperately seeking something. Some glimmer, some... Wasn't easy. There's so much water under the bridge. And then other things began to grow, as you know. It begins with small, then it became financial, obviously always to do with sexuality and other factors. So I've had instances, I have to be honest, that I was not successful. Maybe it was my, maybe my, my lack, something lacking in me. I don't know. In this case, I was. What did I find? So they both spoke about one of their children, who had some special challenges. And I found a little oasis, a little. And I said, let's talk about that child. I was able through the process of talking to them, awaken something. It didn't happen in one meeting, let me tell you this. It took time. Awakening them, those feelings of what they had that took themselves out of the picture when they were selflessly there to help their child. And I literally saw in front of my eyes, they were digging and finding a deeper place. 
within themselves. Well, I could say I helped them get there. It took time, it took months. Because there were things that they actually hurt each other deeply. Not initially, but over time. Over time. And it was that child. I didn't even, we never, we spoke about the child. We didn't meet the child. The child was an adult at this point. What really happened? They, got, they became identified by their hatred to each other, by their contempt for each other. They became identified by the bitterness and therefore lost sight of all the positive. It became distant memories. But that reality of remembering what they did took their egos away and therefore took their immediate circumstances, put it aside, and they were able to find the spirit. Spirit over matter. And they rediscovered, rediscovered, I said, the love. In many ways, this is what Moses did when he stood at the mountain in this 60-day journey. Well, in this case, 40-day journey, and then the 20 days after that, the celebration. But his journey, when he stood before God and trying to appeal to God's, if you wish, heart and soul, to forgive the people, because you really love each other, even though the people did something terrible. So I wouldn't necessarily use the words hate and love in that context, but love, yes. But there was definitely distrust. That's what Moses was doing. He was looking for that deeper place, but it's reciprocal. You can't just have one person go there. You need both people to go there. Or in the case of God and the people, both. This is what this period in time is about. Now, are there short-term solutions? Of course there are short-term solutions. You have deterrence, you have incentives. You negotiate, try to convince someone it's for your, in your interest to hate less and to be more kind, or at least be more conciliatory. I'm talking about also the longer term. The longer term is to find that place. In many ways, it's the mission of my life, is to help people find that place that transcends their wounds, their injuries, their traumas, their pains, their suffering, yes, and their hatred. And sometimes even hatred to yourself. To find that deeper place, that's what you want to access. Because it's not just about putting out a fire. The fire can then burn again. And hatred is a fire. Don't, forget, don't ever think otherwise. It's about finding a place that's deeper that you can hold on to and actualize. And that's very much where we are right now in time. This time of year is exactly that. Can we access, or we can, how do we access that inner place and how do we actualize it? And we actualize it in, as I continuously repeat, into immersing ourselves in the spiritual spa of study, prayer, action, spa acronym cognitive emotional and behavioral conditioning get your mind into another place how much does hatred consume our real estate our minds it pollutes it poisons us read something that's transcendent say a prayer sing a song read a poem that emotionally gets you out of that emotional intensity that emotional toxic feelings when you dislike and all the hatred that comes pouring out of you, spewing, and you don't want to go here or go there because you don't want to meet somebody or something of that nature. And behavioral. Be, act kindly. Act nicely. Say something beautiful to someone. Something heartwarming. And do it consistently every day, especially during this journey. These are the ways you access deeper resources within yourself that in turn change the way you act to others. So if you do have hatred to someone, find someone that you have love to and focus there. You don't always have to fight the fire. Bring love into your life. It feels good. And then let it spill over and see if you can find some way to forgive or to ask for forgiveness. Divide and conquer. You don't have to conquer it all in one shot. 
This is the period in time which we're, in which we are in. And it all begins with a microcosm within you. How you see yourself as part of that larger unity. Yes, that's cognitive. I understand it may not be emotional. But it begins with imagining, dreaming, conceiving, visualizing a more loving life, a more loving world. And then making a reality by first focusing on the people you do love and then letting that spill over. Remember, love breeds love. And of course, the opposite is also true. So it's a firm belief in knowing that light is at the heart of everything, not darkness. And that love is at the heart of everything, not hate. Divisiveness, and even the diversity that it begins with, is not where it all began. It began in a large singularity of unity, seamless unity that connected us all. Then it's branched off. Then it was concealed. Then it allowed for diversity that could and unfortunately has led to divisiveness and ultimately hatred, contempt and other forms that it takes. But it's our mission. Our mission, our very mission is to fight that by reconnecting by looking deeper and realizing these are forces that are holding us hostage to a distorted perception of reality, that things are enemies of each other, when in truth they are really all friends and allies. May we use this time well. May we return, and that's what the word tshuva means. May we return, not repent, return to the very essence of who we are, to the very essence we all are, that larger unity as it manifests in this beautiful diversity. May we be blessed to find that inner place, that inner harmony within ourselves, and by extension, affecting all those around us, and by further extension, the butterfly ripple effect, affecting the entire world. This has been Simon Jacobson, MeaningfulLife.com. It's our website where you can find this and many other resources that talk about timely matters, personal matters, psychological, emotional matters, social issues. Check it out. Please subscribe to our offerings. Subscribe to our growing YouTube channel. Please share, share. Cross-pollinate. And I'd love to hear your thoughts, feedbacks, comments, suggestions. Be blessed, and we continue the journey next week and through our our many different wide array of programs. Be well and be blessed. This program is brought to you by the Meaningful Life Center. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at MeaningfulLife.com slash donate.